I, I, I rolled my eyes a, a lot over the last six months when people said the word prompt engineering, you know, I want to be a prompt engineer. Um, mostly that is because um, I, I think that, th that there's an underestimation of what that actually means. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean, hey, I know how to use ChatGPT. I'm a prompt engineer, right? Uh, what that means is being able to systematically, um, you know, understand what tactics uh, on the prompt side are helpful for actually getting um, improvements in results. And you need to approach that in the same way you would approach any sort of model improvement, right? You know, whether it's numerical with hyperparameter tuning um, or or, um, or uh, parameter efficient fine tuning, which is the, kind of the staple these days, um, or something else, you need to be able to approach it systematically. And there's a lot of value potentially to um, some uh, uh, removal of intellectual burden or intellectual labor from the workforce. I think monitoring of LLMs is going to be a very interesting uh, domain in addition to data generation specifically for domains as well. That could be quite exciting. Yeah, and monitoring and, and you know, certainly there's there's a elephant in every LLM rule uh, room uh, concerning uh, uh, regulation mm. right? and, and safety. So certainly I want to I want to yeah. Uh, uh, bang the table again on, you know, make sure not to leave best practices at the door. Hey everyone, welcome to episode four of the AI Portfolio Podcast, the place where we get to know experts and companies building great products with machine learning. Today, our guest is Dr. Mike Tamir, who is currently a distinguished machine learning scientist and engineer at Shopify and data science faculty at UC Berkeley. Previously, Mike worked as Chief Scientist and Head of Machine Learning at Susquehanna International Group, known as SIG, and he was Head of Uber's Advanced Technologies Group. Uh, Mike is a very technical person at heart, so this will be an interesting conversation, and I highly recommend you follow him on LinkedIn and Twitter, where he posts tons of golden nuggets of machine learning information. I'm really excited to learn from Mike today, to be honest, and I've really followed his career for a number of years. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mark. Okay, let's begin with, uh, given the recent breakthrough of LLMs and their great performance, I think, especially in industry, what are you most excited about? So one of the things that has been really dramatic, you know, clearly the size and the capabilities with larger and larger LLMs has been um has has been beating expectations, not just with the public and and with the, with the uh, what I would say that the the commercial hype cycle, um, but also uh, you know experts are also um, I would say fairly impressed with what these very large language models are capable of doing and the uh, the ability to reason and and um, and show uh, you know, the kind of um, at least apparent grounding abilities that, um, that that maybe earlier iterations have not been able to do. Um, this is thanks to a lot of things, um, including long context and other other um, other specific techniques that we can get into um, you know, as we talk. Um, the specific answer to your question, though, is um, you know we've seen a shift from using single LLMs um, and having our ability to update those LLMs and, and, you know, both for pre-training and for alignment and for fine tuning, um, with numerical updates hmm. to something that's happened, um, more at a, at a, you know, at a, at a, 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 a linguistic representation level, as much as a numerical representation level. What do I mean by that? Um, you know, everybody's favorite phrase for a hot minute has been prompt engineering. Um, you know, the fact that we can, um, we, we can influence the behavior of models to, um, to guide performance systematically with prompting and, and that that's as first class a citizen with getting the results we want as all of the other domain adaptation methods, um, is not trivial. Um, mm -hmm. more importantly, uh, you know, it's not, it's not just on the prompting side, it's on the, um, on the, you know, so there are, there are techniques like, chain of hindsight, where you say, these are what good examples are, these are what bad examples are, and you backprop through with those. Um, there are 
techniques um, like like you see with um, with these multi um, multi LLM agent systems, where uh, you start to um, you start to store and feedback to agent LLMs information, not in terms of vectors and in terms of um, of, of, of uh, um, updates like into to gradients, but in terms of actually storing observations and reflections on how the um, how the agent how the actor LLM had a response with an environment, storing that information, evaluating it, and then calling it back. All of that is happening on a, on a linguistic level now, mm-hmm. which is I would say much. Well, I, I, you know, there, there's a a size and a capability um, threshold that needed to happen when we moved from say the 2022 models to the 2023 models. But there's also the fact that this is now a maybe one of the more more dramatic like lines in the sand that we can say that, that we can you know there's pre when we only our only methods for guiding LLM and, and machine learning and general behavior AI general and behavior was numerical representations and you know rich semantic embeddings to now we kind of have two ways of representing the information that these LLMs and that AI tools in general are capable of leveraging. And, you know, one is numerical and the other one is now linguistic and that may not change. That may be the future from now on. Hmm. And do you also see that transferring over into um, the image domain as well? That's an interesting question, right? So as as foundation models become multimodal, um, you know, maybe when you do a reflection and you're storing, um, you know, some sort of some sort of, uh, um, you know, observation about the value of a certain action that an, that an agent model took, um, you know, traditionally it's been all single modal, and you, you store that that long term memory, so to speak, in some sort of in some sort of vector uh, database that then you can retrieve. Either you can retrieve it all, or you can retrieve some of those observations of what happens in this context. Um, it's certainly conceivable that you might want to retrieve not just linguistic information, but also um, visual and other multimodal, multimodal. Um, uh, 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 I would say, like almost, almost like a memory retrieval uh, with an asterisk. Obviously, these are not these are not uh, um, you know, true actors. Mm-hmm. Um, but being able to store uh, other modes and recall it back it seems like a very natural next step. Yeah, because I, I hadn't eventually. I hadn't necessarily thought about the. I I think I've known that the prompt engineering is this new linguistic layer of communication directly influencing, you know, we have some very large multivariate distribution of tokens. And now by sending a prompt, we are uh, essentially conditioning that particular sampling of that distribution that we're trying to get back. And in addition to the numerical things that we would do before, now we can maybe say, Hey, I'm rearranging the objects in the space. Here's a new um, part or modulating that part of the distribution. So this could be it's a very interesting perspective. I hadn't thought of that initially. Um, what was your first impression of ChatGPT? Um, so, so the fact that you know, uh, in fact, I think it might have been uh, uh, a, a Southern Data Science. Uh, 2022 talk, right? There, there's a couple of like hits of these are the things that are left um, that 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 are that are really big boulders, um, you know. And one of them is obviously hallucinations. Hallucinations are are not a solved problem, and mm-hmm. you know we'll, we'll be in a long tail of solving hallucinations um, with with AI um, for the foreseeable. Right? Um, there are other problems that you know by, by 2022 we were kind of getting to um, to solving. Um, general alignment for sure, right? RLHF by, by 2022 was, um, was something that, that we, we knew and had seen some research on, um, uh, already. Uh, in, in particular, there are things that, um, you know, both with 
ChatGPT, the 3.5 version, and with more recent versions, um, as well as a lot of the other you know public commodity models, um, th there there is a um, sort of like an object permanence and like like having an implicit world model or um, or even epistemic tracking capabilities that were serious challenges and have been serious challenges even even since you know, you know um, in, in the in the era since um, 2017 attention is all you need um, that in the last year have become far less serious problems so so these are the examples of um, you say you know Sally has a has a cup of coffee. She puts it on the table. Bobby comes in and picks the coffee and puts it in the fridge. Sally comes into the room and says, and looks for the coffee. Where does she look? Right. Um, and so being able to um, you know now that this is more or less a solved problem for something like GPT four, um, you, you're usually not going to run into trouble with that. Um, and there's a lot that's going on there, right? There's tracking where are objects having some some sort of um, it, it would seem like a mental model, although there's no mind here, right? Um, so it's just from the the being able to keep track of the the linguistic context throughout the entire um, the the entire uh, receptive field of the of of the um, of, of the prompt and the history, um, and also keeping track of these subtle relationships, like when something moves, it places then temporarily somewhere else. Um, when somebody obs makes observations, then their mental state is going to be misaligned with the reality, at least at first, uh, until, until they learn more. And all of these things seem like, you know, we do it all the time. It, it, it's not surprising you, you, a human in 2022 or, or 2021 would, would also say um, she's not going to look in the fridge. Right. right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Or he's not going to look in the fridge. Maybe I forget who said who did what. Mm -hmm. right? uh, one of the one that the one that originally had the coffee isn't going to look in the fridge. Um, realizing how challenging it is for a machine to start being able to pick that up, um, it, it, it can be sobering that we've actually solved that problem at this point. Hmm. You know, one of the things that was very interesting about the whole Chat GPT moment, I think it fooled everyone to thinking that they had a really good model versus a really good system and, and I, I they just kind of encapsulated <laughs> oh this is just magic model behind the scenes but just seeing at least at first when they came out how much specificity it had how much capabilities it had i have to think and in seeing more of these systems like it's it's actually not a model it's an entire system of different um, error handling, formatting, UI that really makes the true experience of a large language model um, palatable, I guess, for for an individual. What's your thoughts there? Oh yeah, and and you know, uh, um, to to I think many people's disappointment, um, you know, Google and OpenAI and and, and um, you know, uh, uh, all of the the. The people at the front, front forefront of um, of developing these foundation model um, commodity model tools um, are a little more secretive about it, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, hopefully that's not a permanent state of affairs, but it is a present state of affairs. Um, so we don't know exactly what the architecture behind, um, and I don't mean that necessarily in a neural network architecture, yeah. but I mean also just in the system architecture. Mm -hmm. Um, behind GPT, for instance, ChatGPT is, or or or, um, or any of the other competitors, right? Yep. Uh, we can have some strong suspicion, right? When you ask um, uh, in coding mode, um, you you ask a, 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 mo a commodity model to um, you know, develop some sort of you know, uh, achieve some task and, and, and produce the code necessary to achieve that task. Um, you know, there are things that you would expect if different techniques that are public research techniques would happen. So um, the things that you see on the prompt engineering side where you break down the task into subtasks, uh, likely there are specialization, um, you know, wh whether it's a mixture of experts or something else. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, there, there's, there's re it's reasonable to, to hypothesize that that's what's going on. Um, I'm not in a position to, to say anything specific about what happens internal to these companies. Um, but the, the, you know, the black box, uh, the, the inference about what's going on inside that black box, 
um, makes it very natural to think that something like that is happening. Yeah, the whole yeah, large the whole language world. model too is is very interesting versus large language system. Um, yeah. So I, I know speaking to a lot of different people and I, I think at different technical levels, in both strong and weak, there is a sort of a consensus, not a consensus, maybe an opinion that, hey, this thing is a fad. All this whole LLM thing is a fad. What, what's your, your thoughts on that statement? I think it's two pronged. Uh, mm-hmm. In one hand, um, certainly the public hype and the um, and fascination with how good these models are at holding conversations is not going to last. Okay. Right? That's a fact. <clears throat> um, if only because people are going to get used to it, hmm. um, but probably for other reasons. Um, you know, uh, one one reason uh, I forget who made this joke uh, in a public forum, but um, it's not like it, it, it's not like ChatGPT has transformed products like Bing, right? You, 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 nobody's saying I'm going to go Bing this, hmm. um, and, and, and so uh, that's you know, for better or worse. Um, you know, figuring out how to take um, impressive capabilities on the on the part of of LLMs and turn that into um, into into product applications that are more than just a novelty. It's kind of another layer of maybe this is hype, and there's a lot of attention in, and I would say you know, not all of it, but a a large core portion of the attention, both at enterprise level companies and at you know, closer to the startup end of the spectrum, um, are, are probably going to try and most of them are going to fail, right? They're going mm-hmm. to not be able to um, to turn what seems like low-hanging fruit of large language models able to do things that we didn't think that they were able to do um, into useful products that actually transform how people use those products or usual additions to existing products, right? Um, that being said, I don't think it's uh, it's universal. I, I I don't think that in every case it's going to happen that um, you're not going to have a shift in user um, uh, user market share, right? Mm-hmm. Or um, you know, that it's impossible to figure out how to uh, write your emails more effectively or do marketing campaigns, um, you know, in, in, with quicker um, uh, with quicker speed or um, you know, help with, uh, with, 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 with doc review in legal context. You know, all of these different, you know, kind of usual suspects, um, applications are, are probably genuine opportunities for lowering the bar to, um, to the, the, the level of intellectual labor in one part of the pipeline and allowing you to focus more in another part of the pipeline. Um, you know, certainly this is something that, that, that Shopify has been very public about as well is, is how you can manage and, um, and make changes to, um, to your, your shop administration. That's something mm-hmm. that is, um, is, is I think within, w- w- within striking distance, um, a, in terms of using, um, using large language models and other foundation models in order to manage. And then, of course, there's always the product execution piece, which is, as hard and complicated as the uh, as the AI itself, right? <laughs> yes, I think it's a very exciting time. At least, maybe from a builder side, a lot of folks who have who've had great ideas have you know it, it really takes years and sometimes decades to get the true technical skill to bring an idea to reality. So I think it'll be interesting to see, maybe not the large scale, super complex products, but these smaller uh, software products that people have just had. You know, a tiny little idea inside of them for a while, and they get to, I think, bring things to reality. I, that's one of the exciting things I've seen so far. That's probably not necessarily a fad. Even if someone creates something, they're excited. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, I, I'm actually the, the copilot style, um, uh, in particular with coding, mm-hmm. um, is is one I, I would say su- like an incredible success case, right? Yeah, um, this has had a. Um, you know, people might not not have changed their behavior with how they do um, search engines, uh, be, their search engine behavior. Um, people have changed their behavior and how they develop, right? Mm-hmm. And and not, you know, in fact, ironically, um, you know, this isn't. You, you might think, oh, well, people that don't know how to code very well might use 
um, you know, these code assistants more. I, I, actually, I, I would say on the on the more advanced end, you, you end up um, it, it ends up just getting out that boilerplate a lot quicker mm-hmm. for um, for very senior um, developers that I know um, use it quite a bit. And then obviously there's system design and 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 um, fine tuning and you know often you can you can have an an LM debug the code it wrote for you uh, somewhat as well. But um, you know at some point there's going to be human labor. But lowering that volume of boilerplate work, even if you're a sophisticated and, and advanced developer um, or machine learning uh, um, engineer or scientist, is going to you know. That's something that has, a, 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 if you have access to it for your day-to-day work, um, dramatically changed the the speed and the work of the workflow. Indeed, I'm. My dream is to become a level software, okay. so, level five software engineer, and I'm hoping ChatGPT can help me get there because <laughs> I, I find that the level software, level five software engineers see the world very differently yeah. than everyone else who's not at their level. Um, so it's kind of cool mm-hmm. just to see how they operate. Yeah. How how should a data scientist or I think now an AI engineer, I just saw that that's a new term that's coming up a lot more. Uh, how should maybe folks who are not too deep in machine learning and folks who are fairly deep into machine learning, uh, both begin and master their large language model journey. Cause I think now this is a journey that we all, <laughs> we all have to be on to a degree. Yeah. Um, so, so one thing that's worth saying is that um, the, the the research is in flux, and it will be con- continue to be in flux for quite a while. Right? Um, it would be bad advice for you know to consult with a company that wants to work with LLNs to say you should anchor your solution to any existing open source model or closed model for that matter, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, because this is going to continue to evolve, and you want to be flexible for sw- swapping out. Um, in new models and new pre-trains as they're um, as they're available. The so so the learning journey should you know there, there are some fundamentals on you know understanding what a transformer is, understanding you know the decoder side, the encoder side, what are the use cases, what are, what's you know depending on how how deep you want to go. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot a lot of kind of like. Low level, um, you know, down to down to the neural network architecture stuff. That's helpful for context. Mm-hmm. Um, and there, there, are, there's plenty of resources on this, right? I, I believe Andrew Ng, who's you know a good staple in in you know entry low <laughs> entry into a world, uh, just just came out with an LLM course, which um, uh, um, which I'm, I'm sure is with, with uh, Jay Alomar, um, which oh. I'm sure is, is fantastic. Oh, so they I came out with a course together. Oh, that's gonna be a good one. I, oh, I wow. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, two 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 incredible uh, uh, names in in. in um, ML pedagogy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably a great place to get your framework and build from there. Is is these you know not necessarily a, a plug for for Andrew Wing courses alone, but but there are lots of lots of you know good like first coat of paint options there. Right? Um, I tend to like to know the guts of things, mm-hmm. even if um, you know even even if, you know, if there are. Um, not obvious firsthand returns on that for, for whatever your practical purposes are. If you want to be an AI engineer or ML scientist or ML engineer or data scientist, if you're, if it's, you know, in the 20 teens, um, whatever your, uh, whatever your, your title is, if you want to work on these AI systems, um, understanding what's actually going on can be very helpful. Um, and there are some things that are evergreen, right? Having mathematical literacy is evergreen. It's going to help you to understand what's going on, even if we're going from this linguistic turn um, in 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 the way LLMs are encoding things. Um, understanding the math underneath, you know, whatever the ar- the, the neural network architecture um, is not a bad investment, and never will be. Mm-hmm. Um, understanding the keeping up with with uh, with new techniques. Can be valuable even if those fa- those techniques go stale, right? So um, more and more having positive negative uh, um, uh, data sets doesn't mean you want to do the hard thing, which is create a reinforcement learning model and then you know, do some sort of RLHF or RLAIF. Um, 
right? Um, that being said, understanding how that solved the problem has benefits and payoffs and lets you understand you know, what can happen, uh, you know, what are the options in the future. Um, I, I, I rolled my eyes uh, a lot over the last six months when people said the word prompt engineering, you know, I want to be a prompt engineer. Um, mostly that is because um, I, I think that, that, that there is an underestimation of what that actually means. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean, hey, I know how to use chat GPT. I'm a prompt engineer, right? Uh, what that means is being able to systematically um, you know, understand what tactics uh, on the prompt side are helpful for actually getting um, improvements in results. And you need to approach that in the same way you would approach any sort of model improvement, right? Whether it's numerical with hyperparameter tuning um, or or um, or uh, parameter efficient fine tuning, which is the kind of the staple these days, um, or something else, you need to be able to approach it systematically. And so again, this is a little bit more more of an evergreen, um, you know, data science slash ML science skills that is understanding what that ML dev lifecycle looks like. You, know, you need to scope the problem. You need to understand the data. You need to understand how you're going to iteratively improve. And whether you're iteratively improving with data and fine tuning or you're iteratively improving because you have solid test data and evaluation data and you're iteratively improving on your just the parameter, oh, just the, the prompting side, you still need to follow that, that workflow, not because it's um, there's something sacrosanct about the workflow as so much as it's very helpful for making quick progress on something that um, that needs to have a bit of a scientific approach to how you are successful. Very interesting. You you mentioned test data and evaluation data. It seems like a very difficult problem to come up with good test and evaluation data. What have you? I, I know you do a lot of research. I I follow a lot of your posts and you post. Mm -hmm. I would claim you as one of the entry points for beginning and mastering your LLM journey. Just if you just read everything that you posted, I think you'd be in very good shape. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a, I don't know. There's a there's a return on investment for the volume. But, um, that's a very good point, and and that's certainly one of the areas. So I I, I was focusing on more evergreen stuff. There's also. Um, the 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 side of things that that is changing rapidly, which is what are how do you evaluate LLM performance, right? Which is a, a you know, it's it's not just a hard problem; it's also a problem that's evolving. Um, and so, one way you could do it, which is I would say maybe closer to the brute force way or the hardest way of doing it, is you can hire um, you know an army of of of, of reference sentence creators. Who, um, given a, uh, a, a, a an input to an LLM prompt, um, they uh, write up the the ideal or suite of ideal responses that they want to see from the LLM, and then you can fine tune your LLM and you can use all sorts of reference um, re reference comparison metrics. Right, uh, some of those are going to be pretty um, pretty bad. Like um, the the character um, the, the the character or or term you know token based um, you know like blue and rouge um, style ones are are, are uh, more or less a thing of the past right we, we we're not going to be putting a lot of really strong stock in that because it's to the point that getting exact tokens versus getting the semantic equivalence um, it, it, you know the latter is much more valuable than the former when it comes to reference comparison. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we'll move to a more more semantic level reference comparison, right? And so this is like uh, uh, Blue Earth, I think is one of the earliest ones of that. There's a lot of versions where you're actually essentially creating a semantic textual similarity um, evaluator that takes the out, the generated output, the Y hat, takes the reference sentence, the Y, and sees if they match, right? And, and can give a level of evaluation that much. And that can that ha, that has a, a few a few stages. Uh, uh, you know, you kind of peel the orange or peel peel the onion, I guess, uh, on that a, a couple of times, right? You could do just pure uh, STS. You can um, you you can do um, uh, uh, you you could you could you could create 
um, LLMs that evaluate and you have several layers of evaluation. You can have ensembles of evaluators, each of which look for comparison in different levels mm -hmm. for, you know, one might look for fidelity more, one might look more for uh, content and all the things that we have been looking for, we're going to look with those. Now, if you have all these SDS models, what do you have to do? Well, you have to validate that they are directly correlated with human behavior. Right? And so now you, you've done a little bit of, uh, of um, there's in term of art in, in, in software engineering is yak shaping, right? In order to solve problem A, you need to solve problem B. In order to solve problem B, you need to solve problem C. Now we've created a whole nother like sequence of in order to figure out if my LLM is good, I have to create another LLM to, that's going to evaluate that LLM. And then I have to create, you know, and, and you know, hopefully you're, you're not going too many steps beyond that. Um, but it is, it, 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 it's certainly part of the, I, I would call, um, pretty standard process at this point. Um, I said the, there, there's a, this is all predicated on the brute force. Like I have some reference sentences. You could do uh, reference free. And so mm -hmm. when we have like, like LA, I mentioned um, RLAIF, um, there's some papers on, on just using AI generated um, um, text in order to train the reinforcement, the, the reward model that reinforces it, that isn't using the reinforcement learning. Um, using, you know, as we get more and more to, you know, there are um, what are considered uh, almost gold standard models, like, you know, these days, you know, circa what was it, uh, 1156 on a Friday, <laughs> 2020, um, you know, uh, GPD-4 is, is, is playing the role of that gold standard. Mm -hmm. and, have, um, and it's possible that maybe, you know, model, some models are going to converge and, and, and not, you know, we're not going to see a lot of improvement, at least not in, certain, in terms of linguistic comprehension uh, capabilities. And so then they, they can be used to bootstrap other models, right? And to, for evaluation and for generation of data and, and the things we use to train smaller models to be as effective as these incredibly large models. It's a very plausible future that we might be seeing over the next few years. Um, for now, um, using models that are imperfect, even you know, you might you might consider your commodity large commodity models like GPT four to not be always perfect. Mm -hmm. Having cycles, um, and so there's there's a paper instruction back translation that focuses on this. There's a lot of variants on it where what you're doing is you're um, you, you're you're generating text, then you have so you have a generation method that that you assume is going to generate imperfect reference sentences, right? Um, then you evaluate that, or not not just reference sentences, but but pairs of mm -hmm. input and output, yep. where the output is the reference sentence. Right? Um, then you evaluate that with a with a um, you know some sort of automated evaluation pipeline. And now we've you know we've kind of reduced the problem to um, what is a, an older problem of dirty label removal, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of things that that can be done with the game of dirty label um, uh, removal uh, in terms of having multiple iterations. So you train the model, um, you see what are the errors, you remove those errors, and then you retrain the model on the on the curated set, and then you continue that for several iterations. Um, things that have also been, uh, you know, that rem removes variants there is if you have an ensemble approach to those. And so slowly but surely, you can get to the point where um, now you're not and generating all of your reference data, what you're doing is you're auto-generating it. And once you've auto-generated generated it, you can start, you know, maybe you can check it with human labeling, you can spot check it, you can you know, make, make, make it more solid, but now you have reference data and you've reduced it to that first brute force context, right? And again, you still have STS and all of those things and, um, and, and um, you know, you, in, in, you, you, there's still a bit of yak shaving going on. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't want to um, not call call a rose a rose. But um, it, it's uh, maybe easier than how hiring armies of human annotators. And so, this this area these are these are very contemporary strategies mm -hmm. um most agent-based I, I focus a lot on that in, in your first question most agent-based text um the literature goes back to 2022 um and so these are the things that are going to um going to change and evolve and we're going to learn every time there's a 
huge breakthrough. Um, there, 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 we, you know, we see periods in ML literature where um, there, there, there's sort of like tweaks around the margin and we learn better and we get better understanding. And then often there's another breakthrough right around the corner by the time you feel like you've solved all those problems. And that's what makes this life fun, right? Indeed, indeed. Uh, just for the audience, you mentioned SDS when you're talking about evaluation. What does that stand for? Uh, yeah, semantic textual similarity. Oh, semantic. Okay, so I'm just comparing some embedding vectors. Um, you know, I had an interesting sort of like an off research question, and it was around one of your comments in one of your talks around hallucinations and how mm -hmm. large language models are very confidently they they answer very confidently and yeah, unearned confidence, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I, to some degree, that might, I'm assuming that that comes from the pre-training process, right? Giving you question answer pairs and your learning or question response pairs. Have you seen any techniques where people intentionally put like a question and it's like, I don't know the answer and you're intentionally training this thing not to know versus leveraging some guardrail system to say, all right, I, I might not know this answer. So here's the, here's my response versus the model inherently learning that. Yeah, um, so I, I'm sure there's literature on there uh, on that. Um, you know, it's sort of, sort of like moving from the uh, squad one to squad two kind of like leap, right? Where you have an unknown solution to. Um, I, I yeah, I, I'm. I don't I don't have specific papers in mind where, where okay. someone's done exactly what you're saying. Um, certainly, what I've seen is. Um, you know, and there are references like, you know, even like going back to um, the, the Lambda paper that, you know, training on uh, and having access to, um, you know, graph databases mm -hmm. tends to remove hallucinations. Um, I would think that maybe, and, you know, I, 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 what, 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 you're, what you're proposing is, is presumably a very robust um, avenue of research. Um, it seems like we've also moving into agents, agent based context with tools and the ability to have, um, have reference sources. Mm -hmm. Um, so being able to Google your own answer, if you're an LLM, um, it, it can be very helpful. And then like having a RAG process, for instance, can be very helpful in also eliminating hallucinations. And I would think that that's probably going to be a big part of the, um, the long tail, like how we, how we kind of, chip away at, at, at hallucinations um, in the long tail. Of, you know, we're never going to get rid of it completely. It's going to get... We back. still hallucinate yeah, we, too, so I I don't know how we expect but she's yeah, not yeah, hallucinate. Human, <laughs> humans surprisingly also have unearned confidence sometimes. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned RAG, so Retrieval Augmented Generation, and you mentioned agents. Can you sort of describe for folks this thing? I think at very di varying levels. What's your thought on yeah. on the RAG approach? Um, any interesting? I just saw a cool paper called Self RAG, where instead of actually just fetching some documents and then leveraging an LLM to formulate your answer, you are now actually training uh, embedding tokens where you say, "Okay, I actually need to re-retrieve at this point. Oh, this answer is actually not relevant even before I start sending it towards a language model to summarize." Um, yeah, what's your yeah. what's your thoughts on just the rag movement, and where do you think rags will be in enterprises? Uh, I think it's a very um, you know it, it, from time to time you, you see a technique, and and, and you can kind of get a sense that you know this is going to be with us for a long time. Mm -hmm. and certainly, rag as well as like parameter efficient fine tuning. You know, um, those, those are two great examples that are very relevant to um, domain adaptation right, uh, for, for LLMs um, right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would think that uh, that RAG, some some version of RAG is going to be a staple in efficient information retrieval um, for, for for a long time to come. Uh, it, it's just a very natural way of grabbing disparate information. We're still doing a lot of the fundamental stuff in terms of information retrieval to get that seed um, data. There's been a lot of amazing advances in terms of like fast uh, vector retrieval, um, semantic, semantic uh, vector retrieval. Um, and so all of that uh, kind of works very sy synergistically. Um, I, I haven't, I'm not sure exactly which paper you're describing, but um, for self-rag, but, but you know, that does sound like it actually moves into the other um, thing that you were asking about, which is um, agent-based orchestration 
um, is going to have, you know, there's lots of components, right? There's reflective and evaluation um, components. There's acting. Um, so, so hooking up the model with tools and with um, APIs to, to, to access more information. Um, and, and, and there, it, there, there are these, um, you know, these kind of, Either self loops or having multiple different agent, different components of the agent, right? The LLMs that are interacting with one another. And this sounds like what you're describing, right? So you might have a RAD component that is creating a, um, you know, cre gathering the, um, the, the reference documents that are relevant, summarizing it. And then what, what I think I heard you describe was there's an evaluation module, right? So maybe it's another LLM, maybe it's the same LLM that looks at what was gathered, sees that, you know, either either at the input or at the output, whether or not it was a suitable answer for whatever the query happens to be, and then presumably can adjust its answer based on that. Yep, it, it definitely was. And it was one of the more interesting papers I've seen recently. And they also trained it on the Mistral model that just came out. Uh, mm -hmm. So leading leading into that, we have the large, there's the, I don't, I don't like to say debate, there's a discussion, the public forum discussion on large model versus small model, and then enterprise models versus open source models. How are you framing this problem in your mind as it pertains to, let's say, okay, you're an industry and then you're also a scientist on the outside teaching? Um, I mean, well, I, I said my piece on how I, I I, I'm not super enthusiastic about how um, less open open AI is mm -hmm. um, these days, and you know, same shame on Google for 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 that. Uh, their businesses, right? So so yeah, obviously there there are, um, there are reasons why um, you know, that that gambit of closing things down might make sense for them. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, like I said, it's not forever. Um, I don't think we should be under any illusion that a model with 70 billion, let alone 7 billion um, parameters is going to be able to compete in, it's not 2023, with a model that has you know trillions of parameters, yeah. or at least over a trillion mm -hmm. parameters. Mm -hmm. um, and and you, any anecdotal or, or experimentation, anecdotal experience or experimentation is, in my experience, completely consistent. With that, um, with, with that lack of illusion, um, I you know, it is possible that we do see some convergence, at least with this current capabilities. Maybe not with multi. There's you can expand horizontally, certainly um, with with foundation models. Um, you know, it's it's possible that on and in a language only dimension, um, you know, GPT four will start to converge, and, and as well. You know, Claude and, um, and, and Gemini when it one day comes out, right? Um, th that we won't see super huge um, uh, 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 leaps with with later iterations and that uh, along just the capability of working with language models. And that means we can start using these as gold standards and mm -hmm. answer questions like, can we use smaller models or can we use these to train smaller models and get smaller models as effective, right? And actually solve a lot of these evaluation and that and training data uh, problems that are associated with, um, with, with with building these large language models that are not as large um, with limited resources. Right? Um, so that's, that's a, that's a very likely path. Like I said, mm -hmm. um, I think it's worth mentioning, and, and this is not to, to to point fingers at any particular like you know, minstrel or, or um, uh, you know we saw this with transformer models um, and, and like the glue um, uh, um, benchmark um, with like the um, uh, MNOI, so the natural language inference. Uh, you, uh, Sam Bowman and, and his team um, he released this data set, uh, and within like a year. Um, it basically seemed like it was solved by BERT models and, and, mm -hmm. and BERT descendant models, right? Um, and, and then he was like, oh man, <laughs> natural language inference as a problem, done. Uh, but what really happened was there was a lot of information leakage. The, mm -hmm. the, the natural way that we, um, that we set up things like inference problems um, 
is, is imbalanced where we, we, we have like, um, we, we have like, if you're comparing an, uh, um, antecedent and a consequence, um, in, in an inference where the antecedent does it, um, does it, inf- does it imply the consequent? Um, there's going to be overlap in terms that are used in cases where it does that just when you're talking about the natural distribution of the way we have this, uh, the way we actually set up these inferences, um, is going to go, go, going to imply or, or suggest or leak information that the model can take advantage of that, um, you know, you, you can create these, uh, um, the, these clever Hans data sets that, that don't have that information leakage. And all of a sudden, um, pretty, pretty, it's pretty sobering how bad uh, BERT or other encoder model is on these natural language inference processes. Um, without saying anything that is more accusatory than this, um, I, I, I suspect when, when, you know, there's a little bit of hype that, you know, a 7 billion model is as good as a 70 billion model, mm-hmm. um, which defies a lot of reason. Um, probably there are things that it's doing that makes it better than the 7 billion model that it started with, the, the, the initial 7 billion model. And I don't want to take that away from, from, um, from the, you know, the hard work that's being done. I wouldn't be surprised, and that's how far I'm going to say it, if we find out um, in, in either in the near term or the medium term that there's a significant amount of overfitting to whatever the benchmark is mm-hmm. that happens when we get these announcements. That's an interesting perspective. I think one of the one of the observations I've made in the machine learning community is the research community is is quite interested in solving the large pie. They're just everything. All all of language and business is mm-hmm. like, I want somebody to buy this shoe. <laughs> that, that's what I care about. I want someone to buy this particular product. And there's this bounding of the domain when it comes to, especially language, a lot of folks in search recommendation systems. So it's, I have a hypothesis that the smaller models, while on a level playing field, we're competing on the large language, the, the huge total problem of language understanding i think they won't necessarily obviously stack up to a trillion parameter model uh, but i think on these small very specific domain use cases uh, they can be to some degree very cost effective and get a majority of the job done in addition with i don't know if you've seen or have you seen a lot of folks abandon previous approaches and now maybe just use small language models or they're starting to maybe glue some of those things together um, I haven't yet. Okay. Uh, um, that might be a, a, a symptom of human behavior, though. Mm. Uh, where um, you know, so first of all, hosting the hardware um, and putting a commodity model on top, the, the the difference in the in the in the cost is actually not. Um, it, it, not always compelling. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So you can put all this work into um, training a, a, um, a 70B Llama 2 and end up, you know, having a model that is, is, is let's say, best case competitive, um, but not cheaper. Yes. Right. And yes. so why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Now, in the, you know, let's go in order of magnitude lower than that to 7 billion. And let's de-scope, right? So we don't need something that needs multi turns We don't need something that... Um, that, that can solve any host of use cases. We just need a particular use case. Absolutely, right? Um, and, and, and there are smaller, hang- there, there's lower hanging fruit um, and, and smaller tasks like linguistic tasks included that still call for um, for, for small la- uh, sm- smaller large language models, right? Or <laughs> encoder models or, you know, um, so, so you mentioned like for SDS, classically it had been like encode one thing, encode the other thing, compare, right? These days, actually, it's not vector comparison, right? SDS using a BERT actually, is, or sorry, not not using a BERT, using a, a GPT like a GPT four mm-hmm. is incredibly effective and probably mm-hmm. more effective than the traditional uh, methods for for just using an encoder side, right? Um, and so that might be an example of well, do we really need to pay the cost and to use a very large language model, or 
can we get away with something smaller? Um, you know, certainly that's a calculation and then it really depends on the specific use case. That's an interesting point that you bring up with the SDS. So instead of me comparing semantically with vectors, now I'm leveraging that linguistic layer of a language model to compare the true language. So now we're actually comparing in the actual domain of the input data versus some abstracted domain. Hmm. Yeah. So good. And it's ostensible cross encoding. It's also, um, for what it's worth, where we started, where um, you know, it, it's a little bit more on the linguistic you know, um, turn side of things than you know, we vector embed and then we're doing like a mathematical operation. Right? Makes sense. Oh. And this is, you know, GPT has been doing this for, you know, like way back to GPT-2, um, you know, T5, the original T5 mm -hmm. started doing this where, um, you know, it's kind of jury rigging uh, a generative model into giving you, into solving classification tasks. Right? Yes. So we have yak shaving, we have jury rigging. I, I like to keep track of all the different terms that people have, especially sales people have some really, uh, really funny ones. Uh, in line with, with that discussion about, okay, we're solving the big natural language understanding problem, which is bounded in a enterprise domain, like what, what percentage of language modeling tasks um, do, in enterprise specifically do you actually think require that true um, trillion or tens of trillion parameter level of understanding? Um, well, that's <laughs> it's a weird question. I, 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 I well, I, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think I bite my lip on that only because <laughs> I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm at risk of, of, um, you know, sample bias. Mm. <laughs> you know, what, what I see might be different. That's from, Yep. Uh, may not be objective for the, uh, the, you know, the entire world. Um, There are a lot of op opportunities, um, even in the data generation phase um, and, and data quality, um, where using the large and more sophisticated models, I, I think, is is probably a, a, um, a first class citizen. Hmm. Um, and this can go anything you know, anywhere. For, you know, we, we've got multimodal um, versions of, uh, from OpenAI and from, from other sources now too. Um, you know, this doesn't just extend to the the the, um, the story that that I laid out for generating text and 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 creating label data for that that ultimately you can use for other tasks, maybe for tasks on on not so big large language models. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also useful for image applications for, for um, generating sets for that for and as we move into other modalities uh, you know audio etc um, I could see I could see that expanding quite a bit very cool um, <clears throat> as we you lead a lot of teams at, at different levels I think as in looking through your history what's your advice to teams thinking about their large language model strategy. I think everyone now has to think about a large language model strat strategy, whether or not they want to. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so certainly, I want to I want to yeah, uh, uh, bang the table again on you know make sure not to leave best practices at mm -hmm. the door. Um, you know, think about what a good dev life cycle is. Obviously, it's evol it's going to evolve somewhat um, in terms of like what that um, tuning. And, and adjustment of the model and the data phase looks like um, in terms of how you gather and how you evaluate the data that you have gathered. Um, that's going to require a, a adaptation. Um, th there is certainly going to be a tendency, especially for smaller and lower resource teams, um, to say, well, doing this systematically is going to be hard. I checked my five anecdotal cases and it worked. So, what could go wrong, <laughs> um, and, and that would be something that that I I, I would be um, personally nervous if I'm on that team, and, and that I, I would think that um, you know, whoever is listening, um, if they're on that team, would, would would have good reason to be nervous about as well. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And anything on the, I think monitoring of LLMs is going to be a very interesting. Uh, domain in addition to data generation specifically for domains as well. That could be quite exciting. 
Um, yeah, and monitoring and, and you know, certainly there's there's a elephant in every LLM room, uh, room uh, concerning uh, uh, regulation mm. right? and, and safety. Good um, one. The uh, you know I, I, I you know you, you mentioned I did work at at ATG. Um, you know the hardest part about ATG was not getting the car to do the right thing. The hardest part was the fact that. There was no regulation framework um, that that we could rely on or build for us, right? Hmm. Um, it, it was a lot of you know, you build you, you build a jet engine and you're Boeing and you build a jet engine. You have a checklist. It must do A, it must do B, it must do C, and if it doesn't, you can't put it on a plane, right? Um, there is there was at the time no, nothing like that. Um, it, maybe <laughs> maybe uh, Nitsa has gotten better since then, uh, but certainly these days, uh, uh, those days, there wasn't. A, um, and with LLMs, it's it's also the case, and mm -hmm. that is concerning. Um, we don't, you know, it's a careful balance. You don't want to overregulate and make sure that you're cycling and and, and lead to cycling innovation. Um, but we're in a different, you know, going again back to the um, auto ML, uh, uh, sorry, not auto ML, um, um, agent. Uh, uh, large language model frameworks, um, you know, a critical component of that is tools and the ability for, um, for uh, agent models to, um, to, to access those tools and hit APIs and um, do things that, you know, it's not a, that LLM gener, gener, text only generation was completely um, uh, 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 booby trap safe um, when it was just text. Uh, but there's a big difference between, look at these models are not going to turn into Skynet by just, you know, putting out one word after the next, right? Um, and so you could roll your eyes when someone's worried about, you know, about a, a sci-fi uh, danger, uh, um, you know, when, when you're just talking about a, a, a literal large language model. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about something that goes beyond modeling and predicting next words, um, to something that can have access to different capabilities that could interact with um, with systems in the world, especially when there's a lot of work in having models give feedback to other models and having closed loop learning. Um, now things get to the point where um, putting some reasonable guardrails around what you can connect to your automated systems, mm -hmm. how much observation of the progress um that that a, that a self teaching model is 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 um and self self code writing model might be able to, to to create um is not unreasonable and it's something that um certainly should you know, that, you know anyone in industry should self regulate uh, if they, if they think they're getting too close to the line but uh, i'm you know even at the risk of slowing my work down i, I wouldn't be opposed to having um, having the right kinds of guidelines there. Yes, um, yeah. that does seem that like a, a very challenging problem to build into the wild, but build responsibly and like have everyone critique uh, everything that you're yeah. doing. Uh, something you said there that kind of spit us out of my head uh, in terms of tool usage for agents to use tools. And right now, the interfaces through the API or whatever API a uh, current tool has exposed for a human or another system to interact with. Do you think there's a there'll be an evolution of not necessarily APIs, but evolution of instruction tailored towards agents? So like agents can have a whole different, they might operate differently than us, even though it's naturally a series of steps, but almost give them a different level of granularity than that we are given as developers. That's yeah. Um, that's super uh, interesting conversation. Especially, it's it's like if uh, if phase one, the history of neural networks is only new numbers, and phase two is uh, numbers and language and human language, right? Maybe mm -hmm. um, we go to phase. Uh, th there's going to be another phase of um, of of maybe you know optimized for um, inter. Uh, um, into machine community, yeah, into LLM yeah, communication. Into machine, so different from machine language, which is another thing, but um, you know, some sort of intra intra um, agent language. Um, and certainly, the, you know, the, 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 this is not completely devoid, but from what you see now, right, there's domain specific 
languages that that um, that are part of uh, API and and and, um, and tool based interactions already. Um, seeing that evolve, especially if we move to areas where there's um, self teaching uh, uh, more and more uh, with these agent uh, you know, agent training contexts, it's not impossible. Yeah. Great. Um, any predictions you want to make? For like the next few years, I, I watched you had an interview on Domino Data Lab, and it was before. I think not many people were really caring about NLP. Only people in NLP, they just yeah. like doing their thing. Um, but I, I hesitated to say the word prediction. What's your hypothesis, right? Because all all predictions to some degree would just get smashed. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I mean, I feel like I, I I've, I've you did hit you did you did do quite well. Uh, you did you yeah. were on the button, oh. so that's why I asked. Yeah. Um, and well, well, and you know, I, I, I've I violated just in the past hour that the maximum don't don't make a don't make a prediction that could be invalidated in your lifetime, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, to be to to recap, certainly that the the um, will there be convergence of um, of very large language models to the point that they're Use then to um, to bootstrap up smaller language models mm-hmm. um, or just text gener- uh, training data generation in general. I think is a very safe um, hypothesis, as, as you put it. Um, it's it's a much riskier um, in the sense of I, I don't know if it's a real risk, but but um, it's certainly just a, enough of a, a enough of a risk that it's worth considering um, you know, at, at a societal level, whether or not and to what degree we should put in safety um, hmm. uh, safety restrictions on, on the use of AI. Yep. Uh, something that I, I, I've been until 2023 not super concerned about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's probably good? where okay, I want okay. to stop. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's more wild things to talk about, but uh, we'll save that for. Uh, we'll for, keep those off the book. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, philosophy conference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, here's an interesting one. If you were building a machine learning startup today, what would you go build? I'm I'm trying to recruit you, Mike. So I need to know what startup yeah. I need to to start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, 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 I've done LLM startups before. I, mean, I'm, mm. I still have uh, the, the swag to prove it, right? <laughs> um, currently wearing an old, an old uh, a vest from that, right? Um, there is something exciting for everything that I said about nine, you know, whatever a large proportion. Maybe it's ninety nine percent. Maybe it's less. Um, are going to fail in terms of this? These like you know, ostensible low hanging fruit. Um, there is a lot of value potentially. There's a lot of opportunity to displace workforce as well, which which we may want to think about. But there's a lot of value potentially to um, some uh, uh, removal of intellectual burden. Our intellectual labor from the workforce mm-hmm. um, in, in lieu for for for, um, for other use cases. So uh, I'll name I'll name three. Right, one I already mentioned actually, which is um, software development mm-hmm. and, and coding yeah. in general. Right? Yeah. Um, opening that up for the wider world. Um, you know, there, there's still work to be done, and, and like I said, it, it, it mostly this benefits, ironically, the advanced developers, not not the entry level developers, but um, you know, figuring out ways of, of maybe turning that around and opening it up for um, for more. And I don't just necessarily mean low code, no code. I also mean um, figuring out ways of helping people that want to develop just gain those skills more quickly. And that kind of mm-hmm. leads into the second area, which is um, education. Yeah. Um, um, adaptive education, um, having you know, for the longest time, um, you know, uh, education has been um, this almost performance art where you have a single person, they get up in front of a class of you know, 20, if you're lucky, um, students, um, and, and, and each student has different learning needs and different, um, they're at a different place right now, and you know, different, they, they learn different things in different speeds, and you're doing one delivery for all of them. And, mm-hmm. and so there are, in instructional design, there are 
ways of, of, of addressing that that have been contemplated, right? So maybe you um, have a video for everyone and so it's performance art and you get the perfect performance. Um, and then the, um, it's like, this was called a flipped classroom design where the, the, the teacher then does the tactical things that's tailored to each human, um, each student, um, and, and after that baseline is there, right? Um, the opportunity to, uh, to, to have adaptive learning that is really well tailored to individual students, um, has, 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 has progressed astronomically along with the opportunity or with the, the potential that LLMs have themselves. And certainly there are um, strong efforts at uh, the Khan Academy and lots of others that, that are already trying to tap into that. But that's certainly an area where, um, you know, you might work at worry about about displacing labor force um, uh, um, in a lot of contexts, but we have a global um, uh, shortage of quality education mm -hmm. educators, um, and in particular, a national sort shortage for sure in, in the U.S. Yes, um, and the opportunity to change that um, can only be good, right? if only because it it, 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 it um, means that there's going to be more resources for better teachers, even if there are fewer teachers. Um, and, and, you know, I think you ones. might end up seeing people want to teach more because they, they're they supported and they have, they're not limited by, oh, I don't have budget to hire X amount of teachers, or oh, you have this AI that's teaching your students, and now it might actually become a much more enjoyable activity because I can only imagine the burden on a teacher. They have their own things in their lives. They could be doing other things to make way more money, but they choose to stay to... Uh, to really educate and i th i always admire teachers just because um, i think it is a sacrifice to go be a teacher especially when in the high school levels and things like that <laughs> deal with teenagers all day um, they need they need some ai in their life <laughs> yeah and it, and it shouldn't be a sacrifice it's that mm -hmm. um it, it's 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 a it's a it's a unfortunate vicious cycle that keeps getting more and more vicious every time we turn the screw so to speak um, and and you know, there's a potential for solving this with technology, or at least helping mitigate um, this vicious cycle that keeps going, that keeps turning. Yep. Um, a third area, which um, which actually uh, is something that that, that I, I, I I recently uh, became aware of, um, is you know there's the legal profession, right? Mm -hmm. And so so a, a, a colleague showed me some studies on. You know what, where we are right now with with legal with high quality legal um, uh, um, assistance mm -hmm. is uh, it's kind of broken, right? The only people that can leverage um, uh, um, you know, legal support in a reasonable way and and get a um, and and you know, get the results that they want are people that are very rich mm -hmm. or get a lot of donations. Hmm. And anyone else is systematically uh, disadvantaged when they walk into a courtroom or when they need um, they, they need to use a lawyer. Yes, um, and that's because there is a, an absence of um, supply of labor. There's a labor shortage for high quality legal support. Hmm. And so, with the rise, and this is a very la uh, very, very very plausible use case for. Um, for using foundation models to supplement that intellectual labor, there's a potential to um, you know, ostensibly increase the the labor supply when it comes to lawyers. Very cool. um, and if there, if it, if there are more lawyers that are able to do more, and then you know maybe the high cost, the astronomical cost of getting legal support can go down because no longer are you paying not just for the person, the human that, that, that has their, um, their legal degree, um, you're paying for their paralegals and, to, and, you know, maybe a team of other lawyers or doc review and all the other things that, um, that are attached to a single hour of, of an attorney fee. Right. Yes. And, and by lowering that, maybe more people can have access to attorneys. Um, and it doesn't become, this 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 um, you know, systemic problem that even you know that that you might um, you might settle or you might um, you know take a deal um, even when you're not at fault just because you can't afford 
to go through that whole cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's a potential benefit as well. That's a good one. I think when ChatGPT came out, I decided, oh, I should go be a lawyer just because I was putting a ton of legal contracts in there. I was like, what the hell are these people saying? And ChatGPT was helping me. And I was like, oh, I could. Now I see the power behind obfuscated pages of law that you could you fall into so many holes you come out of one you fall in the next one and so that those are cool uh use cases another so the show is called ai portfolio one of my targets is for investors i i just like talking to investors in general and very curious as to i think how companies last long term what advice do you have for vcs you gotta step up vc yeah yeah. Yeah, I think they have, um, they have the hardest time right now for evaluating a machine learning startup. So, you, you know, they, 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 yeah, they, they have a hard time, I'm sure. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I support uh, one or two VCs um, okay. myself. Um, there's there, there, there's a um, two wrongs make a right um, benefit that's going on just like right now. Uh, it's an accident of history. So what are the two wrongs, so to speak? Um, One is that, you know, we've come out of a a more than decades long, decade long uh, period of zero, zero zero interest rates, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, Not, not for, not for the, (laughs) not for the humans, but for for the institutions, right? Yes. Um, Or at least at at, at, at some point, you know, some, some high level for the institutions. And, and um, what, what that has resulted in is a slowdown in the ability to easily share capital, um, mm. and, and, and not the least of which with VCs. Right? We we put some regularization penalty on 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 loose capital, uh, um, you know, shared with VC, with, with uh, by VCs with startups just because they're AI startups. Hmm. Maybe a wrong, um, but combined with the fact that there are a lot of, um, of of startups that that are probably not thinking through, um, or don't understand, or um, you know you know, won't be able to hit that execution um, a, a effective execution point. Um, that you know, it's probably for the best that we have that regularization penalty because there is. Um, there's more noise in the data, mm-hmm. and because there's more noise in the data, we don't want to um, we, we don't want to overfit. That is to say, we don't want to overinvest in a lot of the the cruft, so to speak. That that is not or the, the chaff. Um, you know, we, we want we want to be more judicious about you know figuring out what is the weed. And invest so it's really that. forcing them to focus on what how good is this opportunity and continuously questioning that. That's very interesting right. perspective. Yeah. You end up getting to five wise instead of three and a half or maybe just one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a good point. Uh, do you think VC should be studying LLMs and machine learning at this point? Because it feels like everybody's going to have to know something to a greater degree than well, a beginner course. Um, probably, yeah, certainly if they're in that space. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, luckily, mo- well, luckily for the VCs, most of them have smart have folks one or two experts yeah, right yeah, yeah. That's um, fair. Mm-hmm. or, or, or they, they find you know people like you and i to to be their their extended support in that sort of context mm-hmm. makes sense makes sense um one of the things I've, I've admired about your career you've been at some of the big companies uh, you've always been at the top in terms of your technical game and you've led different teams what are can you comment on the differences in data science culture across, let's say, what you've experienced at Uber, what you've experienced at Susquehanna, and now Shopify? Uh, yeah, um, every place is certainly going to be different, and every place is going to be the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so the difference is, you know, in culture at, at a place like Uber, and, and recall I, I was there during the... Um, during the, the period from um, from Travis leaving to uh, IPO, mm. um, which is certainly a um, you know even from from you know the months in the beginning to the months at the end of that of that tenure, um, were, were very different, right? Um, partially because of you know personality and baked in culture from you know from from, from the top down um, and the change of that culture to um, 
you know, the, the, what needs to happen with the company when it, when it does go IPO. And, um, that involves actually shaping and reshaping the, the ML culture as well, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that you are, you have higher standards or at least you do have uniform standards um, and, and making sure that you have certain, um, you know, certain protocol for how you're going to approach ML projects um, in, 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 you know, I, I would say at a place like Uber, that means that, um, you know, not so much that, that you know, there's systemic um, uh, issues of, of people doing things the wrong way and you know, making them do the right thing, but, but more that you need to, um, to spread out more of the, of the right way um, to the right areas, hmm. right? Makes sense. Um, at a place like like SIG, um, you know, certainly that's going to be initialized at a culture of you know of, of what you see in quantitative finance, which is typically quite cautious, um, mm -hmm. quite cautious uh, because there is a real um, and, and um, you know a, a, a bottom line cost to um, to not being cautious. Yes, um, and, and that can be measured uh, and and you know. Quantitative finance. Uh, it's a lot of money. Companies going to be uh, very used to measuring that risk, right? And, and it's going to be baked in the blood, right? Hmm. Um, a place like a, a place like Shopify has a culture of, um, you know, let's build and let's build quickly and see if it works. And so, uh, calibrating that with making sure that you're building things that are not going to die um, as soon as they get shipped to production um, is, is, you know, a part of the culture that certainly um, is in my blood. And again, it's making sure that you're spreading out that knowledge uh, you know, more, more reliably across a larger organization like Uber, or like Shopify is, is um, you know, when, when you, when you have a role like mine is, is going to be pretty essential. Mm -hmm. What's your approach to, leading teams when you come into a new business because that's a hard problem you you come in you're super senior like yourself and different culture different game um well uh, uh, uh you know this isn't this isn't a uh um this ho hopefully isn't, isn't going to be like a, like a, a trade secret right uh, hopefully it should be a surprise to no one but um you being able to roll up your sleeves and and you know work <laughs> well, uh, work work on the on the actual problem mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and, and being a, a very very hands on. Um, so you're still you know, coding a lot these days. Um, coding, looking at um, looking at, at actual like you know uh, uh, at, at results, um, mm -hmm. you know, evaluating experiments, uh, you know, and and understanding and. Uh, uh, um, analyses of those results. Um, it, it it doesn't hurt to to you know to be tactical, especially early on in a, in joining a new company, because a you get a real sense of what's going, what 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 the truth is, right? What do people actually do? Um, and b you get to know those people. You can't you can't do that. You know that doesn't scale, but it, it certainly is something that it has value, especially initial. And, and C, hopefully, um, you know, if I'm <laughs> if I'm saying sharp myself, um, you're able to to let everyone know that that you that you know how to do the job too, and yes. um, and, and hopefully can can develop that trust with them. Yeah, I think that's one thing I've admired about your career. You've intentionally like you're on the button. I watched all your talks before, and like. Shit, this man is on the button and he could i think there are always opportunities to not necessarily course but hey this is good enough but it seems like you're aggressively always pushing i think you're always finding new interesting things online so i always wonder how much of this is mike actually reading every day <laughs> um I um, well, I am. Uh, I, I think it's fair to, fair to say uh and, and i haven't been shy about sharing this i i don't share um live every, everything i post uh three times a day I, I i save it and then i i queue it up um you know, sure, so, so there's sure. gonna be a, a there's gonna be a time lag in, in like when i look at something i save it and then i queue it up 
that's fair. Uh, every couple of weeks um, to, to be spread out over rather than like, you know, sharing uh, 100, 100 articles all at once. <laughs> hmm. What does it take to succeed on a team like yours? Uh, what do I need, you know? What do I need to be to, to come in on a team like yours? I'm, I'm coming to try. Uh, well, um, first of all, I, I, I'm a big fan of vertical integration. And, um, an effective team is going to have a diversity of skill, going to require a diversity of skills. And um, succeeding in building a team is going to require not waiting until you find that one person that can do all those things only, right? Or, or that, that only that person can do all those things. You know, it, it's It's probably a um a failure mode if if that's what you can, you, you want to do and i mean that that's maybe a maximum for any team but especially for the um the very complex field that um, machine learning applications um you know the consistent machine learning applications um and so specifically to, to what was probably more in line with your question is um you know what does a person need to do to succeed um it depends on that skill set, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's uh, um, there, there's deployment of ML, there's engineering skills, there's product skills, there's um, actually understanding how to develop ML models, um, you know, some more like science skills, um, and each of those has a role uh, in, in making sure that you're very good with that part of the role, but also can understand and co communicate and um, work with and sometimes supplement but it shouldn't be you know being you know, expecting that you can do everything for every for every skill set wrong expecting that you can communicate and that you have an awareness and can work with and sometimes supplement other skills other skills yeah right that makes sense um, what's the hard part about managing both large and small teams of data scientists we're very opinionated people so <laughs> <laughs> Um, the hard thing about large teams, um, or really large organizations of many teams, um, is, is probably uh, um, you know ensuring that consistency. Hmm. Right? Um, there's going to be more variance the larger your 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 data set, right? Um, and, and not just because you know, that's not a that's not that's not a you know it's a maximum for, for sampling data, but it's also going to be a maximum for um, the fact that as you grow larger, there 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 are um, you're going to have to make changes in terms of like you know what bars are you going to set for each skill set, mm -hmm. and if you want to reach scale, that's going to be inevitable, right? Yes. Um, for smaller teams, um, you know, typically in a lot of ways that's easier, right? It, it's harder. If you're at a startup, because you, know, you have to define um, you know, what is what you, know, you have to do a lot more product definition. You have to do a lot more. You know, there's a lot of ambiguity uh, involved. You have to find product market fit. Um, and those parts are hard, um, but it's also easier in that you can have um, you know a few good people that are a little bit more on that um, that that side of. You know, maybe they can do multiple skills mm -hmm. at the same time, right? Um, and that can be a lot of fun. And in some ways, it can be um, you know, a little. You, you you can kind of get spoiled, right? Because <laughs> you you think that just because that worked when you were a small team, like, that you It'll can work. scale up that way, and, and um, that's, that's a that's a failure a, a failure mode for sure. Interesting. So I just have a couple more. I have a couple more. Well, well, we'll end in, in nine minutes. That's that's the goal. Uh, what makes you really good at your job? I mean, presupposes I am really good at my job. <laughs> um, uh, I I don't know if it makes me really good. It's certainly been helpful that um, I enjoy. You, the, the juice for me is. Um, it's certainly the building and getting to see like you know what can what what can be made mm -hmm. um other juice that 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 is is kind of just like a nice um has nice side effects is that i like learning about what's new out that's out there i i, I like engaging and i i um you know i left grad school and thought well that there there goes my learning phase uh time to do my doing phase and um you know take anything i've learned and, and try to 
um, try to apply it to, to, to working. Right. And, and I couldn't have been more incorrect that, you know, mm. I've, I've learned more maybe after grad school than I ever learned in grad school. Um, and, you know, and certainly like some of the things that you learn in mathematical literacy, you can leverage and it has a multiplier, but, um, the, the the fact that you know it's almost without effort that that um you, you don't have to like plan hey i'm going and now i need to catch up with literature it almost happens like um automatically mm-hmm. that you see oh this is happening I'm, I'm getting a bunch of notifications about about this particular technique and maybe i should look into it and and one by one day after day you know year after year um the new techniques and the new um, the new things that you should be focusing on um, pile up, and and and, and you, you you start you you, you kind of consume it, and you you um, you know maybe maybe, maybe uh, uh, I've been lucky in that I've developed uh, some skills in in getting a better sense of which papers and which techniques mm-hmm. are probably going to last, and I should really focus on this versus things that I, maybe I'll read that if I have the time. Um, but it certainly isn't a hard thing to continue to stay engaged with new technologies and new, um, new research and, and new knowledge. Um, you know, that kind of is part of the, the day to day. Um, and, and it's, you know, been really lucky to be in a career where that's possible. Yes, indeed. You did your PhD. Why would you do such a thing? And what advice do you have for those thinking about doing their PhD or not thinking about doing it? <laughs> um, yeah, and I didn't do my 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 I did my PhD in uh, in philosophy of physics. Uh, so, yeah, you did some uh, yeah, aggressive yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, and and, and the, the program I went to was was is has the reputation of being like the, the place you do you go to if you want if you want to be a technical person in that area. Mm. Um, not all, you know, other, other places are, you know, kind of you know, stroking your beard and saying, what is the, me- the measurement problem in quantum mechanics? And that's not, I always found that a little bit uh, um, less engaging. Um, I, I, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't have been more lucky um, mm-hmm. in, in getting, you know, taking the degree I had, you know, getting all the skills I, 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 um, I did get from that uh, that graduate program, um, and then just by accident of history, being able to get in on on AI and machine learning um, at the point that I did, mm-hmm. um, the entry point for 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 data science or machine learning science or whatever, it's much more challenging. The, um, you know, twenty twenty three than it was, you know. However many years ago <laughs> um, that it's been, um, and and that's uh, that, that that's that's unfortunate. Um, huh. it, you know, certainly, there, there's a lot of opportunity for people that know their stuff still, um, and so if someone wants to get a PhD, um, there's a lot of value and there's a lot of benefit for that. Um, you know, there there is something broken in modern academic uh, academia. Um, and, and I'm not talking about the politics. I'm talking about the um, the the fact that you know, the, the system is designed to um, to create more and more uh, what's called like, like in in in, um, in management services. There's like the principals, and then there's like the senior people, and then there's the leverage layer. And leverage layer is short for the people that get taken advantage of. Um, the leverage layer in academia has grown proportional to like the tenure layer um mm-hmm. uh, um you know dramatically um it, it's even like even more so since i left that's one of the last 20 years right um and that means that there's less and less incentives for people to get a degree if their goal is to be an academic um, right which means that and, and you know there are all sorts of social forces behind that as well as academic, as, as, as sorry, economic forces. Um, if you're going to get a PhD in machine learning and AI or you know, technological degree, you know, in the first place, the good news is that there's real, you know, <laughs> unlike 
most philosophers, uh, where there is no <laughs> industry unless you're really um, niche technical like me, um, th there's not a lot of opportunity outside of academia. Um, in technical degrees, there, there's a lot of opportunity. And, and you know, unfortunately, um, you know, working for an industry lab is probably a better opportunity than working for an academic one. Yeah. Uh, but you still teach. So tell us, you know, why do you continue to to teach us that are sharpening a forcing mechanism? Is that your regularization function to learn? Um absolutely it forces me to it forces me to learn. It forces me to really ask every semester we we you know it, 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 it's it's you know a, a team of us um, mm -hmm. and we ask ourselves um what happened in the last three months, like just this, this semester, <laughs> that um, is important and that students should know about. And will be, you know, we're, we're, what should we teach students? Because it's not, you know, it, it's not hot this month, but it's going to be hot for the next, you know, yeah. several years, and yeah. it's worth learning about, right? So, um, fast attention, rag, grammar, efficient fine tuning, in particular, Laura, um, those sorts of things are just good examples of like the last, you know, six, six, seven months, maybe, maybe. You know, 12 months with with alignment training and you know um but but the in particular the the, the subject that, that i do which is natural language processing deep learning um you know, it it changes so quickly um you know the the we just redid the 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 async curriculum um Ber berkeley has a you know at least theoretically has a flip classroom model and so you, you record videos and then you have lessons that are supposed to just like be supplementary to that video as well. But, it, but it, 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 you know, after about a, a semester, that's not the case. And you end up just teaching whatever's new. Um, mm. you know, and, and the, uh, the videos are staler and staler and staler. And, and already it's just been a year or so since we, since we did our last round of videos and already most of it is completely stale. Wow. And, and feels, feels so, um, so old fashioned. Uh, and, and so the, yeah, it is a bit of a forcing function in that way. How many papers do you read a day? What was that? How many papers do you read a day? How many papers do I read a day? It depends on the day. Some <laughs> the answer is zero because I have to read too many Slack messages. <laughs> um, that should be a good. That's some, a good question. I should ask people that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some the, the uh, you know the, so so I have reserved time. For that, I, I have to. Um, I also travel enough that you know, and and often to the East Coast that mm -hmm. uh, that I, you know, if, if I if I travel two weeks uh, two two weeks a uh, a month, and I, that's two cross country trips. Um, you know, that's that's like four solid days a month where I can get through you know hmm. dozens of papers because I I, I, I you know just nobody's gonna message me or anything. So I, I can, focus <laughs> that's that's the uh that's the true trick they didn't teach you in school how to have let's say 500 stack messages and still get your work done and yeah and, and be in uh video calls oh. back to back for for you know 10 hours a day <laughs> oh, yeah that's that's a whole different game so last couple of questions what's your career optimization yeah. function is it for you is it intellect it seems intellectual you like staying sharp um how have you chosen to regularize yourself as you navigate your career? Um, so I, I've been in a um, unreasonably, like I, I've said this a few times already in the last hour, uh, I, I've been unreasonably lucky mm -hmm. in that I, I've, mm -hmm. I've been able to just focus on you know, learning the craft and, and the, 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 the career progression has, has been, I think, easier than, than it would be even like if I if I'd done if the same exact know. things today. Mm. Um th there's also a, a symptom that um you know sometimes there are motivations beyond like let's build what's right or let's you know let, let's make the right decision that you see in um in corporate environments. Um and unfortunately uh you know when you have less control it makes it like it can influence um, decision making just because we're made of human um in ways that um that that don't happen when you have more control mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. um that has the and, and maybe this is a good thing there, there there's other studies that that as you get higher up in a, in a company hierarchy 
um, you know, you get less good at listening, for instance, right? Uh, uh, so, um, so balancing, counterbalancing phenomena like that is important. But um, as you have the ability to have to to have more control over more things, um, if that's the kind of person that that um, type, type of personality that you have, um, you end up not making the mistakes that happen when you know, you're trying to grasp at you know the, um, the sorts of things that really in the end don't matter you know, um, like showing that you're doing good work rather than just doing good work hmm. makes sense makes sense are you a reader technically you read papers so i'm assuming to a degree yeah, uh, yes quite quite a bit <laughs> okay what three books do you recommend not necessarily papers at least could be books anything that sort of influenced your life um so well i'll tell you uh, i i just and i'm embarrassed that i didn't didn't realize that that um ted chiang was was so uh wonderful uh, i i just poured through both of his collections of short stories um so 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 uh, for, for you know, for, for those of you who don't know, like the, the uh, he was a rival. The movie was based on one of the short stories. Mm. Um, that is uh, anybody who's interested in in, in you know, um, more technical stuff. Uh, you know, it, you know, there's literature that um, that that is deep and has many layers of meaning, and and um, you don't need to know any math for it. And then there's the this this is you know Te Chiang's work has all of that. And if you understand um, th things like like uh, uh, um, uh, Lagrangian mechanics in in uh, in, in, uh, um, in physics versus versus like you know the the high school Newtonian version of things, um, adds a whole other layer layer to the story. I forget the the, the title of the, of the actual short story, but hmm. um, that's how he put. That's how he explains what happened in the Arrival movie. Um, uh, with like you know, seeing the future and the past, and and and, it, and it's um, both both beautiful and deep and incredibly um, on point for uh, for for like like the right tone without over forcing like you know things just because they're cool mathematics. Um, so that's that's pretty the, the, cool. You know, the, yeah, the, 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 that, that that's certainly one that I would recommend to anyone, especially people that probably more likely to listen to this podcast. Um, <laughs> I also just started um, you know, started uh, uh, reading through some books. So, so Song of Achilles and Circe um, for two um, like uh, completely different, not not very technical at all. But um, I forget the author now. But um, so the, Song the, of those are two books by the same um, by the same author, and there's sort of these like um, uh, uh, different takes on, uh, on 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 the perspective of like Patroclus and Circe and. and um, ancient greek mythology which is very engaging i find so this maybe those aren't my I, ted chiang certainly is, is going to stand the test of time but that's one of you know, those like the last four books i've read very cool <laughs> and my last yeah. rapid round of questions you're stuck on an island okay with a specialized chef and you could only get two meals what two meals would you have hmm. It's a tough one. Oh, sheesh. Um, really yeah, one. do I have to worry about health or not? No, 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 no. You just, in pure, uh, pure yeah. bliss inside of yourself. Yeah, you're stuck on this mm. island for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, surf and turf, right? Mm. <laughs> Especially if you're on the island. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, yeah, some, some, uh, uh, some, some sort of effective salad in, uh, as well. Okay, yeah. all right. That's, that's been Balance the, it out. That's one been one of the most reasonable answers I've heard so far. <laughs> My favorite one so far is fried chicken. Someone said fried chicken. I'm like, chicken. I'm, I'm with them on that one. Uh, what's one thing? <laughs> what's one thing that brings you yeah. joy? Mm. I, I I am a uh, uh, amateur woodworker. Oh, so uh, nice, yeah. nice. So everything I do in my garage, but even just opening the garage and walking in, it brings me joy. <laughs> that is, that is definitely a hobby I want. I want to get. I I follow like a bunch of different YouTubers of woodworking, and I'm completely fascinated by them. It's it's a beautiful yeah. craft. <laughs> and my last question: What do you want people to remember about you? This could be, you know, doesn't have to be the world or anything, but it's a question I like to ask people. Uh, just, just curious, actually. These are uh, they're very deep, but that's yeah, we're at the end. 
thought into these, right? <laughs> um, so why don't people remember about me? I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I don't know if I want anyone to remember anything specific about me. Um, you know, remembering. Um, you know, Well, okay. So, so if you know, like, what, what, what would I want on my tombstone? So, to sort of thing, remember about me? Um, I, I, I'd love to be remembered um, for for maybe being a little bit more uh, um, for being intellectually honest, mm. right? for um, for being willing to to question my assumptions and not um, not adopt arguments just because they support the conclusion that I want, regardless of how I got there. Um, that's certainly a, a vice that um, that has a stranglehold. <laughs> Maybe it's always had a stranglehold on humanity, but certainly it feels mm-hmm. like it's had a stranglehold on modern society. And, and I, I would love it if I, um, I, I I lived a life, and if I'm remembered for it, even better. Um, that that um, that has intellectual honesty in that way. Very cool. I appreciate you coming on the show, Mike. Uh, it was a pleasure. I learned a lot, and it was a good, it was a good vibe. <laughs>